Let's just see what we've got going. Yeah. If you just say a couple of words so I can check a level. Yeah, all right? Yeah. Is that okay? That's fine. I'll take it you don't want me to move from. It doesn't matter. <laughs> You'll be okay. It's got, it's got a little bit of leeway on that. So it won't matter. All right. Um, I thought I'd start with something fairly simple and then move on to your time at East Pool. Mm -hmm. And then I've got some sort of a little bit more general questions about processes and your experience of mm -hmm. certain techniques and um, responsibilities and stuff. But the first question is, uh, when and where were you born and brought up? Born in Hull in East Yorkshire mm -hmm. and brought up there and uh, we were bombed out at the first blitz on Hull and we went to live out in the country and uh, from then on I uh, went into uh, coal mining and I was in coal mining for a short period and then uh, I don't know whether you, you knew the system during the war they had a national call up and they called you up in age, age groups. Well, when my age group came along, uh, I registered, and uh, they wanted to know what your occupation was. Well, up uh, to then it was all, all sorts, but I chose to say coal mining, and then uh, they said, right, back you go. I said, well, I don't want to go back to coal mining. So they said, well, there's a choice of gypsum, or oil shale, or lead, or tin. And I thought, tin? Where was it? It's a tin in Britain, you know. They said Cornwall. Well, immediately, uh, you know, uh, I saw visions of sunny Cornwall and the Cornish Riviera. So I said, uh, all right then, if I've got to go, I'll go into Cornwall. Because when I arrived here, instead of sun, it was pouring with rain. I think he's done that ever since. And uh, then I went to into uh, lodgings were found for me in uh, Trezevine Terrace in Lana right opposite the Coppers Inn, with a Mrs Jolly and her two sons. And uh, another chappie who had who, uh, been put into the mines as a Bevin boy, and he was called Roy Trevathan. I lost touch completely with him, but he was from a butchering family. Now, I don't know whether he's still alive or whether he's dead or what. Anyway, and then I, uh, from there I had to go by bus to... Uh, each pool every day and uh, the coal mining experience when you get into Cornwall is of very little use to you because one's soft mining and the other is hard rock so you've really got to start again uh, so there I was with a very very mixed labour force you see just before the outbreak of war each pool was suffering badly it was on the cards it was trying to close but uh, the Ministry of Supply realised that the, the, uh, the supply of tin throughout the world was very restricted, so they kept these pool going, and they then had to try and recruit labour. So they were they brought back men out of the army who'd been called up tin miners. They brought those back. Mm -hmm. uh, they also they had the current workforce, which is very small, and the key men were brought back out of the forces, ex coal miners like myself, Bevin boys, Optants, those are men who opted to go into the uh, mines rather than the services, there was the option <coughs> given. Some Dorsal clay workers, we had quite a lot of Dorsal clay workers came down and lodged locally and then went back every weekend and came back on a Sunday night ready to start work again. And we had Belgian refugee coal miners, a very good, very good men. They came over after uh, the invasion of Belgium and they came and there were six or seven of them worked at East Pool. Tragically, two of them were killed down East Pool. Mm -hmm. Then lastly, a very little known fact, but we had 30 or 40 Italian prisoners of war working at East Pool Mine. Very few people know it and very few people know that the actual prisoner of war camp was in Chapel Street in Red Ruth. It's uh, the uh, Chapel of Ease right opposite uh, the chemist shop. It was more recently used by Brundles as a store for clothing and different things. But that was uh, a prisoner of war camp for Italian prisoners. Now they were marched, they didn't work night shift, they worked morning shift and afternoons, and they were marched from Red Ruth along the main road, Lugan Highway, and into uh, 
East Portland, and they went underground with us. For what work they did, just as well they never came. <laughs> they were very good at singing, operatic arias and whatever, and they all wore hair nets and dark greasy hair. Anyway, they worked with us, supposedly, and uh, as I say, there's not many people in Red Ruth remember that. And there's certainly not many remember that it was a prisoner of war camp at the Chapel of Ease. Mm -hmm. That's due to be demolished soon to make way for a car park, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it went on. We uh, we mined 11 shillings a day. That was the underground pay. But you were underground rather than on the surface? Oh, yes. I was yes. underground all the time. Yeah. That was 55 pence a day. And, uh, uh, if you're on the surface, it was uh, nine shillings a day. That was 45 pence a day. You worked an eight-hour shift, and you uh, you rotated your shift. One week it would be uh, seven to three. The next week it'd be three to eleven, and the following week it was night shift eleven to seven. Mm -hmm. So you you rotated. So the man was working 24 hours a day, and. Uh, he worked six days a week. On a Saturday, you were allowed to come up. Instead of coming up at three o'clock, you, you came up at one so that you could see the local rugby match because Red Ruth were uh, in the ascendancy then. <laughs> very, very good. And uh, the mining went on. I remember a, a few cases of uh, a bevin boy came down. And his mother and father came down with him. And uh, he was an artist or he was going to be an artist it was pretty obvious yeah. long slender fingers and all and uh, they approached the man captain and said they didn't want any special treatment for their son but you know they wanted his fingers to be looked after because he, uh, he had quite a promising career in front of him and no sooner had they gone and the man captain who shall be nameless put him in about the worst possible place possible a lot of us ne never liked what happened to him but uh, this man captain said, right, you know, I'll have you, and he did. I don't know how long the chap lasted, but he, he wasn't long before he left. Well, as a Bevan boy, if he left, then he was immediately called up into the forces. Mm -hmm. I suppose he, he preferred that to being mishandled down at East Pool. <laughs> anyway, that same man captain uh, died a very tragic death of silicosis later on, and I don't think there are many people who grieved about it, I'll tell you. Uh, there's, there's a few points, also down at East Pool, very few people know, uh, there was uh, pit ponies worked underground. There we are. Uh, they weren't called pit ponies down here because they referred to them in coal mines but nevertheless they did work down there they went down at, uh, there was two ponies they didn't work night shift they worked mornings and afternoons and uh, as far as I know there was only one other man ever in Cornwall that employed a pit pony and that was uh, Levant down to uh, now there's some other Queer points about Eastpool and Crofty. We, we compare Eastpool and Crofty. You know how close they are. They're, they're within less than half a mile of each other. Eastpool always measured its depth in feet. This is very, very unusual because Cornwall, they measure in fathoms. So Eastpool uh, levels were uh, 900,000, uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. 19 was the bottom level, because I was uh, sinking down to 19. And they used Holman's machines. Now, across the road at Crofty, it was all read in fathoms, 290, 310, 335, and so on. And they only used Clamart's machines. Now, can you imagine it? Two minds where you could see each other. One measured its depth in feet, and the other in fathoms. One used uh, almonds machines and the other use climax. You know, uh, I uh, there's there's not a lot of people remember that, but there's not a lot of people living to remember that. But uh, going back to the the pay, there was an additional three pound a month bonus 
on top of this 11 shillings a day, you got three pound a month bonus, providing you only lost one shift. If you lost two shifts, you lost half of your bonus, which was one pound 10 or one pound 15. If you lost three shifts, you lost all your bonus. So that was one way of keeping you working. Uh, if you were injured or anything, well, that, that didn't count. That, that was, uh, you still got your bonus because uh, it was no fault of yours that you're off. Uh, we had extra soap ration because you were showering every day. And we had extra cheese ration because it was thought to be a heavier work that demanded cheese. Whether you had the money to actually buy this stuff <laughs> is a different tale altogether. On 11 shillings a day and paying your bus fare, eventually you had to get a bicycle pretty quick because you couldn't afford to keep it up. Um, and this, the, the work down there continued. Uh, as I say, uh, I was what you call stoping. That was the easier side of mining. The more difficult side of Cornish mining is development, where you actually drive a heading or a tunnel. That calls for all the Cornish skills. But once these people have driven the heading and opened up the ore, it is reasonably simple then for somebody to come along and mine it, what you call stoping it out. That That is easy. So uh, any new intakes to uh, East Port usually finished up, if they were any good at all, they finished up machining but stoping. But the, all the, the uh, development the heavy uh, uh, work that called for a lot of experience was done usually by the local men who, who, who had been mining uh, granite all their life, hard rock mining. Mm. And so it continued. I, I did go uh, one period uh, onto a development end, and it was one that had been tried years before. And it was called the Torgus End. Now, from East Pole, they drove the level towards Torgus because um, geology indicated there was a very, very high grade of ore in the Torgus area. Well, it's another, uh, they, they tried years before, and uh, they, there was a geological fault, and they couldn't find it at all. But when, when I was there, I went into this, the um, Torgus End with a chap called Wilfred Beckerleg. Very big cyclist, huge chap with a big beard. Never found out what happened to him. But him and I were working in there, and it got so wet. And we weren't using electricity, which is ideal if you're, if you're blasting. It got so wet that uh, blasting with fuse, you only, uh, if uh, blasting about 18 holes, you only managed about five or six, and you had to run out then. <laughs> because instead of being able to, to cut the fuse, all the way round, and then just go and do that. You had to cut one and shield it well. The other man lit it, so you were delaying all the time. But eventually it got so wet and dangerous in there that it was stopped again. So we never did get through to Tolkas. Mm -hmm. uh, so it went on, and then there was a, a big breakage. Uh, one of the balance boxes on East Pool pump broke. The balance boxes, and uh, near the surface or quite deep? No, it was one down below. I think there was three. There was a surface one, but there's another couple further down, and that one broke off from the rod, and the rod just dropped, and we were transferred over to Crofty, South Crofty. And while we were over there, one of our party he was killed. He was called Gooch. He was a Bevin boy. He was from St Austell, and. Uh, Instead of using the toilet and back shaft, which was a long walk, he uh, attempted to do his business in one of the old workings and he fell about 300 feet. And that was the end of poor Ted Gooch, I think. Uh, and what else can I tell you? Oh, yes, when uh, we came back, there was then the Ministry of Supply. I don't know why, but they, I suppose if they realised that they were uh, the uh, tin position wasn't so difficult as they thought at first so they started having second thoughts about keeping each pool going 
Now, a dozen of us were asked, or you weren't asked during the war, you were told by the uh, Ministry of Labour, we were told to go to Giva, Giva Man, to transfer to Giva. Well, in those days, Giva had a bad name, not necessarily for silly courses, but it was a very, very cold and wet mine, and there was always a threat about tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. Well, I had been newly married, and uh, I said, I didn't want to go, and the wife said, oh no, you don't want to go to Giva. So, me along with five or six others refused. When was that then? How, how long had you been here before that was...? Oh, this was... Uh, this was about late 43. Mm. Late 43, and... I can't, I can't really think for a month or two. Anyway, a fortnight afterwards, we refused to go to Giva. We were called into Red Ruth and given a railway ticket to go to Scotland. And that's the way they used to work it with you. Instead of being at Giva, where you could come home every weekend, you went to Scotland, where you came home every four months, you know. So, so well, that was to a coal mine in Scotland, was it? Yes, yeah, coal and yeah. fire clay, yeah. yeah. I went up there, and uh, I was a borer and shop firer up there, yeah. and deputy. Deputy is uh, similar to a shift boss down here, but you do shop firing in uh, hazardous conditions, you know, where there's methane and all. So, and I stayed there until... Uh, Victory in Europe, that was before victory in Japan, and I came home and I started work straight away at Crofty, South Crofty, and I was working normally there for a while, stopping actually, and uh, that thing they asked me if I would go uh, mucker boss on the night shift, and uh, I did. Kept it going for about seven or eight months, and then they decided that it wasn't worth doing. So they stopped the night shift and brought us all on for days. And then some big arguments followed, because when you were on night shift, as soon as you'd done your stint, you came home. Even if it was two o'clock in the morning, you, you know. But uh, when they put us on the day shift, they said, you, you do eight hours solid on the ground. And mm. After being on this task work where you could come up when you finished, it didn't go down very well, so we had a big argument, and two of us said we weren't going to go on the ground again. And I didn't. I, I worked at uh, St. Oldsville Clay Works and uh, Falmouth Docks, and then next thing out of the blue, uh, a chappy in Red Ruth, uh, his name? excuse me a minute, I'll have a look. Uh, mm. I think I've got it on your list here. I always forget his name. I went to his funeral recently. Jimmy Venton. Jimmy Venton. He had just got come back from Nigeria. I didn't know at the time, but I answered an advert in the Western Morning News saying that shift bosses were wanted for Nigeria. So it was only a bit of fun. I wrote. I wrote away. And they said, well... The man who will interview you or bring you to London for interview is lives in Red Ruth and it was Mr Jimmy Venton and he's on leave from Africa. So I went to see Jim and he said, God damn it, he said, uh, you were uh, interested. I said, well, it all started off as a bit of fun. And uh, so he said, well, I'm taking six or seven other blokes up overnight. So I said, right. So I went with him and uh, there's another chap called Frankie Hall from Campbell. Well, when we got there, we were interviewed, and it was found that the only ones with any experience at all suitable for Nigeria was myself and Frankie Hall. So we then sent off to Tavistock Square to be x-rayed. Well, on the way to Tavistock Square, Frankie Hall said, I failed Africa a few years ago. I said, what were they? He said, Tysus. I thought, oh, God. Because you can't get over tight, so you only get worse. Anyway, uh, I said, well, don't go rushing and coughing there. We'll go quietly. I was as silly as he was, really. He had his x-ray, I had mine. We came home, and after about a fortnight, I had tickets to fly to Nigeria. This was 1951. So I jumped on the push bike, and I went out to Pengeg in Oak Camp, where Frankie was. It was Sunday morning, he was in bed, 
His wife gave him a shout. Down he came. He had his arm all bandaged up. And he said, the buggers are going to pay for this. And I said, what's wrong? Well, his, uh, his smallpox vaccination had taken. And he had a terrific swelling on his arm. And he was off work from Crofty, you see. So he said, they've got to pay for this. They've got to pay for this. I said, anyway, when are you going? He said, I'm not going. I've failed. So after all that, I was the only one who left here. Out of the eight of us, <laughs> finished up in Nigeria. And that was through Jimmy Venton. He was home recruiting labour and he got one. He got one to go there. And uh, while Jimmy was home, he decided he didn't want to go back. So he stayed at home. And I went out there and I was there about three or four months and the mine closed down. Well, there's still a lot of... Um People who'd been recruited in Cornwall working there at the time then? Yes, there was, yes. There was a chap from Hale called Bill King. Uh, there was another uh, chap called Bullock from Rounding Walls. I think he emigrated to Canada afterwards. <coughs> and there was um, uh, Treve Holman. He was actually from uh, Holman Brothers. He wasn't really near the family, but it's just coincidence that he was called home. Yeah, there was quite a few there. And... Uh, Let's just say the mine closed down. We came home and uh, I had to report to the London office, which was called Finsbury Pavement House. There. And I went there and uh, they said, would you like to return to Africa? I said, well, I haven't had really a good dose of it. You know, so I only had three or four months. I said, yeah. So they sent me along to another office and uh, they said, go and introduce yourself. And it was Conongo Gold Mines, and uh, I went there and I had two tours at Conongo Gold Mines. And to better myself, when I came home, I resigned and went back to another mine called uh, Prestia or Ariston Gold Mines. I think that was then the Prince was some of eighty pound a month, because in those days that was good money, mm. it was very good. Mm. And so it went on, and then I carried on, and I went to um, the British Aluminium Company. Mm. And uh, and I uh, had a, a couple of years at home because uh, Africanisation was coming in and everybody was afraid that their job was going to be taken over by an African. And I was at home and I uh, got a telegram. Would I ring the London office? And I rang them and they said, we've got a job for you back. It was just on an open cast mining, you know, out like huge quarrying. And so I said, what's the job? And they said, senior mine captain. So I said, oh, good. good. So up I went for an interview. When I got there, the chairman, Norman White, said, sorry to call you up here, Len, but he said, the job isn't for a senior mine captain. I said, oh, hell. He said, it's assistant mine superintendent. I said, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> then I had another four or five years uh, uh, on African Manganese Company. And I came home and uh, that was the end of my mining career anyway. So your wife was with you in Africa? Uh, a certain period, yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, she was at Conongo with me, she was at Prestia. Yes, and she was at uh, African Manganese Company, yeah. Uh, some of the mines, you had to do 12 months to prove yourself before they'd let you bring your wife out. But once you, you, your name was known uh, throughout West Africa, and it was the Gold Coast I worked in all the time. Once you got one, uh, you know, it was about two or three hundred people out there were household names, you know, they were either no good or people accepted them straight away. So we, uh, there are other minds you, after you've been there a couple of months, they say, well, send for your wife, you know. But some were a bit cagey and said, do 12 months, let's see how you manage, you know. So you, you kind of broke the connection with Cornwall altogether then for a time? I broke it uh, after I finished at Crofty. I broke, uh, broke my connection with uh, Cornwall uh, for good. I didn't... Uh, I, I, came, I, came, I came home on leave to Cornwall and then eventually I settled down uh, back again in 1967. I came back and I went straight to uh, the sheepskin tannery across the road and uh, worked there and did quite well. Got a big tourist attraction going there. Mm. And uh, when I retired at the age of 65, uh, I was then approached, would I like to uh, 
do a job as a guide in Paul Dark Mine. <laughs> so over a period of uh, one year, and I had, a, I had a break, and then I had two years. Yeah. You know, worked three days a week underground, showing people around and explaining. I think that's, that's about the extent of my mining. How long did you do that for? Hmm? How long were you at Paul Dark Mine? Well, one one year. You you go there in um, say when it starts getting busy, May until. September. You're still doing it now? No, 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 I've finished now. Yeah. No, I haven't done it for two years now. Yeah. Have you had any contact with um, visitors over the road at all? You've... Uh, only with uh, Stuart. Yeah. And uh, as I say, he asked me to um, have a look around and I, I got all these chappies together. Yeah. And uh, we were there at that photograph that you showed me in the West Britain. There, that, that was just the uh, the first opening of the visitor centre, but then the big one when Nigel Griffiths MP came down, we were all invited there again, and uh, we were lost in a sea of uh, dinner jackets and <laughs> who just stuck in the corner there. You know? But uh, in a lot of down suits and uh, about a hundred. You know? yeah. I'm not saying we were totally ignored, but uh, it was just a little. Unclear in one corner, that's all. And uh, Westwood Television did take three of us up into the, uh, the uh, engine house and the pump right at the top. And they did quite a long interview with us, but nothing ever came of it. I don't think it was ever shown. Mm. As all this editing goes on, you know, they speak to you for half an hour and then you get about three seconds. <laughs> but uh, Dale Webb then approached me and said, uh, Could I get a couple of Macronis and we came into the lounge there and again did quite a long stint with us. He's a very, very nice fellow. And then uh, we appeared for short bursts on this uh, Between a Rock and a Hard Place. And since then, uh, there's been no contact at all, really. Mm. Only each time I look out through the front door, I see East Pool Chimney, E P A L. By the way, that means East Pool and Agar Limited. Mm. A lot of people still don't know what he meant. Mm. <coughs> and he was such a big producer of um, arsenic in its heyday was East Pool that they used to uh, market arsenic under the trade name Epal. Can you remember... Um, well, I, I, I'll get you to describe the, the sort of works on the surface and so forth and Dan Colvadon, but... Can you remember the Calciners? Where were they? No, I never ever uh, went to uh, Tolvad and the Mill. Never. No, no because we were you were uh, always underground. Mm -hmm. and the uh, the only uh, thing I remember about that was the aerial ropeway. Now, before the aerial ropeway went in, and I wasn't here then, of course, but uh, it was brought out to the main road, and it was, uh, it was electric tram went uh, and then he bounced off at the top of Tucky Mill Hill and went out that way. But uh, we had an aerial roadway that went in a dead straight line to Tolbadden from East Pool. But uh, I remember that because uh, as a uh, ore or dirt we call it came up into bins and then it was released into these uh, buckets and it went on the aerial roadway. But we never ever really mined high quality stuff because um, we were down in depth, and, and, and instead of like Crofty, where in a lot of cases the the quality is maintained as you're going down and down, and he's put it in, they gradually taper it away. Mm -hmm. So eventually, uh, our bottom level there, as I say, I was helping to sink, and we sunk down to 1900 and cut off and went for the loads, and the loads were no more than a pencil mark on the granite. They were literally yeah. nothing as wide as your finger, yeah. no, just uh, a blue line, and that was that was it. But there was a mine captain there convinced that if you went deep enough, all the loads in East Pool would eventually join together into a massive one <laughs> that never came off. <laughs> so I can't tell you about cal signing at all. But this, they weren't still cal signing anyway, were they? By the time you started, were they still doing that or? They weren't selling the arsenic anymore, were they, I shouldn't think? No, uh, not only did the uh, market reduce for arsenic, but uh, 
I think uh, the uh, the arsenic uh, in the in the uh, ground at Eastpool was petering out. I think it, it only occurred in the higher levels. There's some massive uh, loads up in the higher levels, like uh, ten and eleven hundred. Uh, I don't know how true it is, but some of the old miners have told me that they didn't even have to blast it out. They just went in there with bags and shovels and shoveled it. Neat tin almost. But there's some very, very big places underground there, like football fields, empty. Huge places. workings they they were abandoned and uh, nobody's really allowed into them only <coughs> we had a very big smash up on the shaft uh, a cage uh, with a truck broke away and it went through the shaft and it ripped a lot of timber out <coughs> and I was on shift at the time with a lot of men and we, the cages couldn't be used so we had to climb out of East Pole. And the chap who knew the way out was Wilfred Gribble, he was a shift boss, he was only about that high. I'll tell you about something else about him. And we climbed up the main shaft until we got to this uh, broken timber and everything. And then we went into the old workings, and he knew his way through the old workings. And I've never been, I won't say frightened, but uh, it was really weird because some of these old workings, you looked in there and you could literally hang a carbide lamp down on a rope and swing it like that and you couldn't see either side or top or bottom, just to avoid you. Know. And old uh, roads, uh, what you call swing roads, on chains, you know, wood and on chains and uh, we walked across those and I was glad to get out of it. And then we climbed then, uh, after we got past the break in the shaft, we then uh, got back into the shaft and climbed up the shaft ladder to the surface. Where did you come out then? Hmm? Where did you resurface? Where did you come out? Well, you come right out at the top of the shaft at East Pool. Yeah, the Mitchell's shaft? Uh, Taylor's. At Taylor's? That's where oh, yeah, Taylor's, yeah. Yes, I only ever worked at Taylor's shaft. Yeah. I mean. uh, and uh, there's a ladder way yeah. from uh, the surface right, right to the bottom level. Mm -hmm. It's got to be because shaft men uh, travel that ladder way every day inspecting the pump mm. and greasing pump and whatever you know, do, do uh, shaft inspections as a matter of fact uh, there's a chap called Paulie Cock and uh, he was a shaft man I've got him here he was a shaft man and his, his partner didn't turn up so he went and did what you call a doubler he went and did a second shift and he fell through the shaft and was killed yeah, cock, where is it? I'll just show you around on that. Body cock. Yeah, I can't find him here, but. And then we, we also lost another Bevin boy, called Hancock from Falmouth. He was in the sheer shaft that I was sinking in, and he was stood in the middle of the shaft on planks, and he was handing tools to a, a pump man, who, he's dead now, but he lived a long and long now, where he was called Jack Craze. And Jack Craze was in the side of the shaft repairing this pump, and Hancock was uh, in the centre of the shaft handing him tools, and a cage broke away. The rope broke, and he came down and hit him, and that was his chappy Hancock killed. Um, I was telling you about this Wilfred Gribble. He's very, very short. <clears throat> well, night shift there, the stokers on the surface, well, the stoker in the singular, he, uh, he would often fall asleep. He was supposed to be keeping the steam up for the 
the Cornish pump, well, the steam went down and the pump started going slower and slower. <coughs> or, like they say, it lost its stroke. When you came back shaft to go up, many, many a time, you'd be up to your waist or possibly chest high in water. No question about it. Well, Wilfred Gribble, he was so short, he couldn't get back once he would have drowned. <laughs> so he had to go up to the next level and get a cage from the level above there. And when he got up, <coughs> uh, the, the day shift, when he got into the dry and we changed into the day shift, uh, what's it like down there? He said, oh, all right, you know. Much water? Yeah, six inches. Oh, all right. Nobody had ever told the truth because <laughs> the day shift were going down. <clears throat> and you had you had your kraus or your crib in a bag and you also had a tin full of carbide well you know what happens to carbide if you get water in it probably they will blow up well just as you were as the cage was approaching the bottom level because it was lit up with electricity and somebody shout out look up because everybody then lifted their bags the food and the car right up above the head and they'd go down into waist high water and that was starting work then. But as you <coughs> as you left the station where you had uh, arrived at and walked in, so the ground rose and you gradually left the water behind. So that, that was collecting just because the pump was running? Yeah, yeah. The, oh yeah. So it flooded as quickly as that? Oh yes, yeah. <coughs> yes, the pump... Uh, he, he, he lost steam on it, you know, somebody got him. Well, they wouldn't give him a good idea, but they would give him a good telling off. Because one tail there, uh, the place was full of smoke, and the, the, this is what's said. There's a lot of good Cornish expressions. Ca the man captain went over and saw this uh, little stoker, and he said, uh, I want you to uh, barrow out all the smoke, uh, get a wheelbarrow and barrow it all out, there's too much smoke in here. So the chap looked round and he said, right captain, I'll barrow it out if you load it. <laughs> so that was very good. Yes, he said he'd push it out in the barrow if the man captain would load it up. <laughs> so what was it, when you first arrived there, what was it like at, um, what was the engine house like? Was it, did it look quite primitive or was it? Were you used to that sort of thing from the coal mines? No, I've no, never, never seen that. Everything in coal mines is electrical. But uh, no, it was a marvellous piece of engineering. It still is. I mean, people can go up there. And, uh, and uh, everything was immaculate. Everything was kept. Unless you had uh, reason to go into those places, you're never allowed in. Mm. Especially the whim, the whim place. Uh, and they had coconut matting and all the handrails are all uh, a a film uh, of oil on, you know. And as soon as you open that door, the, the hoist driver is shouted out here, get out, Tom, what do you want? You weren't allowed in there unless you're really on business, you know. And uh, it's a world of its own. Lovely machinery, and the compressor house is the same. What was in the compressor house? Well, they're, they're huge compressors. Yeah, for what, sort of, what sort of machines were they? Oh, they, were, they were Holman compressors. Uh, yes, they were, they were steam driven, mm -hmm. steam driven with uh, flywheels. <clears throat> I remember one case, I was, I was telling my wife about sinking, and because you're in the bottom of a shaft with two or three machines going and all the funk flying, and it's really naughty. Anyway, she said she wanted to go underground. And at the time she was working for the post office during the war and uh, she said to the men in the post office that there was horses working underground at East Pole, you see. She'd never seen them, but she told them and of course they started pulling a leg, no, no. And it wasn't leg pull, they really believed there was no horses down there. Mm -hmm. So I took her down there one day and she actually saw the horses. As soon as she got out of the cage she saw the pony there. But when we made our way to the cage on the surface, <coughs> word went round that there was a woman going underground. You see, you don't really, you don't really like it, isn't it? Right, well, they don't really mm -hmm. like it, but that was all right. So word went round, and so give them a, a fast ride. And by a, by a fast ride, it's 
they, they pay out the rope off the drum faster than what the cage is falling. So the cage is falling free, isn't it? Well, right at the last minute, we got into the cage and the, the, the bounce man was just beginning to ring down to the level we were going. And the mine captain, Freddie Scorpel, came up. And he said, hang on a minute, I'm going down. And he came down with us and just before he left, he got on, there was a voice tube to blow into the wind driver. And he blew, when the wind driver said, yes, said, take it easy. Because they could not give us give us a fast ride then because <laughs> the, the mine captain had told him to go easy. But otherwise she would have had a, a real nasty ride. Yeah. That's too bad. Well, anyway, what, what happens when it suddenly? St- I mean, if you're paying out a lot of slack like that, mm-hmm. what happens when it suddenly catches? Does it snatch and danger of breaking? Or is there any way of well, pushing no, it? <laughs> it doesn't break. No, it just bounces up and down like a yo-yo, you know. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, it's a bit of an exaggeration to, chase, to say that they they paid the uh, rope out faster than a cage could drop. I, I think that's almost impossible. But. Uh, they gave you a, a lot faster ride than normal. And then when they did stop, if they stopped quite sharp, uh, if you were stood up in the cage, sometimes you'd, you'd, you'd fall down and you'd be in a heap in the bottom of the cage, you know. But then the cage would be doing that. No, no, no. There's so much stretch in a steel cable, you see. Yeah. Yeah. What was the average journey time from the surface to, what was the deepest level you were at? Uh, deepest level at East Pool was 1,700 main shaft and then you walked in maybe a quarter of a mile and then there was a, what you call an internal winds there was another shaft mm. but that was inside it wasn't connected to the main shaft mm. and that went down from uh, 17 to 19 mm. but uh, riding time I can't really tell you you're talking in terms of um, I don't know four minutes four or five minutes mm. Mm. in Africa we, we used to and in each pool and croft, you put about eight, anything from ten to a dozen men in the cage. But in Africa, there was fifty or sixty went down, and uh, that was electrically driven. Mm-hmm. And uh, you had rubber tires on the side of the cage, so you had a real smooth ride. You know, oh, just going down the <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. And there was about six hundred men on the ground. We had to get you all down within so many minutes. Because as soon as the last man was down, the cages came off, mm-hmm. and the uh, the big skips were put on to start hoisting dirt. Mm-hmm. Did that happen here then, or, or how was the ore actually transported? No, at East Pool, all the ore came up in trucks. Mm-hmm. So the trucks would drag it. Yeah, uh, a truck was pushed off the station into the uh, cage, mm-hmm. and then sent up. And when it got to the top, that truck was tipped literally hand tipped and back it went now Crofty it wasn't uh, after the men went down at Crofty they were switched to skips the cage was taken off mm-hmm. and skips were put on and then the skips were loaded they were loaded from a big chute in the shaft and loaded up and then it went right up to the surface and when it got to the surface like that the uh, the guide rails then turned mm-hmm. and the skip would tip and then down it'd go again mm-hmm. just excuse me one minute mm-hmm. There was a, a system at Crofty where the first men going up were timber men. I don't know why, but they always got priority. And uh, they used to sit in the skip, which is against all rules and regulations. They sit in the skip, and then the uh, the hoister, the wind driver, then would be given a man riding signal to say that there were men riding in a dirt skip. You see. So when he got to the surface, he'd stop and then he'd climb off and then Skip went further up. But one day something went wrong. I don't know the hoist drive thought he still had dirt on and he had about five men in it. And he got them almost tipped over like that. And they were all screaming and shouting and just realised. <laughs> no, there was one period uh, down his pool. Uh, it was about three o'clock in the morning a lot of us had finished work. Instead of waiting until seven o'clock or half past six, we said, right, we'll, we'll get up early. So we got on top of a, a truckload of dirt. 
on the truckload of dirt, then the signal was one, one bell. It go straight up to the headgear. Then the man would pull the truck out and tip it, you see. Mm. And three or four of us sat on the truck would jump off quick and then nip down and have a quick bath, you see. But uh, the shift boss must have realised that there was something wrong because he was out there waiting. And as the cage came up level, he rang the bell and of course the driver stopped straight away and he looked down on four or five and he said, where are you going, my answers? <laughs> I don't know who it was, but he said, oh, we're leaving work. I'm, no, you're not. Down you go again. He said, you'll have me bloody hanged. And he banged back. I'm like, where are we going? <laughs> right down to the bottom. Never forget that. Down you go again. You'll have me hanged. He said, Oh, there's some funny times, but uh, there's some sad times as well. I wasn't actually at East Port at the time, it was before I ever got down there, but there's a chap called Puff Yorn. He was working a shoot and uh, something was stuck and he put his hand up there to try and loosen it and the storm came down and he had to have his hand amputated, his hand was left behind up there. What was he doing exactly? Yeah. Well, he was he was tramming, what you call tramming, and the chutes, the dirt comes out of the stove in the chute, and you've got boards that you lift to control the floor. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you've got a truck full, you just put the board down again. Well, uh, something went wrong, and he, he poked and poked away, and he couldn't release the dirt, so I think he put his hand up there and tried to release it, and because this big stone let go, and he got his hand and, he sent for the doctor. Uh, there's no way they could get it out. So the doctor amputated his hand there. Underground? Mm, yeah. Underground, yeah. 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 Old Puff was stood in a truck. and Actually, you see that photograph you showed me in West Britain? That's Puff there. Ah. His hand is hidden there. Mm. But a very, very insensitive reporter from Radio Cornwall. She was on loan from a Dutch radio station. She was a Dutch woman. And she started on about him and he's losing his hand. And Puff started crying and she kept on and on and on. And eventually I just knocked her one side and I said, that's enough of that. Mm-hmm. And she realised then that she'd done wrong. But she just kept on and he was really breaking his heart, tr- trying to explain how he'd lost his hand. You know. Yeah, that was Puff. Oh, we used to have some wild times. The changing room, what you call a dry, the dry where you're supposed to dry all your clothes, you know. Have you never seen so many fleas in all your life? If you sat in that dry, they'd be falling around you like rain. I've never seen anything like it. Terrible place. And you had to hang your... When he came from underground, if you were wet, you hung your clothes, and put them on a chain and put them right up to the top and there was steam pipes. And mm. you know, Next time he came on, they were dry. You know. But when you went underground, all your good clothes had to hang on that same chain and pulled up to the top. Well, they were getting plagued with fleas. I had some fleas on every day. Every day. <clears throat> then it was always the, the jokers would uh, undo your chain and put a couple of bicycles on it, you know. <laughs> when you let the chain down, supposedly to let your clothes down, there's two bikes, you know, <laughs> come crashing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Where was the dry then? Was it next to the boiler house? Now, you know, we're uh, up to recently, uh, Cornwall Paper Salvage people had oh, it. That, that was a big one. Yeah, that was a big one in the back. Mm-hmm. I've heard that I think the. Uh, the uh, East Pool uh, Heritage Centre are going after that building. I think they partly got it, but that was a big dry. Yeah. Mm. So what, I mean, uh, uh, well, that's a, a sketch I took out of a, a book <coughs> somewhere. That's the uh, that's the road. Yeah, Aerial yeah, yeah, that's the tramway. Where if you yeah, that's just when they they used to come out here to the main road. Yeah. Okay. And in those days, there was a very very big uh, concrete block making business here uh-huh. 
Very, very big. What was that for then? We're connected we're making to concrete blocks from uh, the material that came up from underground. But oh. it was only uh, what you call <coughs> development material. They wouldn't use anything with mineral in it, yeah. not from the load. Yeah. That went that went to Tolbatten. But any of the pure white granite, when, when they were developing, looking for loads, that came up and was stacked in waste bins. Yeah. And... Uh, and then it was drawn off, and there was a very, very big works uh, making mm. concrete blocks. Mm. I think what, what was the block called? Was it Honey Church? But there was a lot of block making went on there. So the dry was here somewhere, wasn't it? Yeah. The stuff that's uh, yeah, along the back. And at the end of the dry, there was a little house there. That, that's where they kept the ponies. Ah. Yeah. So where? I mean, I'm, I'm a bit confused about how the. Where, where was the whim? Because if the whim was that was really the pumping engine, so that's the whim. Where, where was your where was your pumping engine? That's that's the pumping engine. Pumping engine. engine. Shaft, and that's the shaft. Well, the whim was there, and oh, so and so. next door was the uh, compressor house. So yeah. the the whim, the ropes came up over and down the shaft. Yeah. Well, if you go there to the visitor centre now, yeah. the whim house has just been uh, re-roofed. It's yeah. got all the roofing on it. So what? That was just electric then, or was that steam? No steam. Steam. It's just a small, small stationary steam engine of some sort with the. No, oh, it's uh, very, very big. Was it? Yeah, oh, yeah, very The winding engine, oh, yeah. I didn't realise there was another engine there. So, so that was. No, there, it didn't there. No, no. It was removed for scrap. That so that was went the trouble. With the rest of it in yeah, 1945, the, only, then. the only thing that was saved was uh, yeah. the pump. Because it was pumping still engine. pumping. Yeah, everything, uh, yeah. The, uh, everything was sold for scrap. Terrible. Because it was marvellous machinery. Yeah. And the compressors and all, all went for scrap. Yeah. I wish they'd been there today. It was marvellous stuff. How old were those compressors then? Were they put in in the 20s when, when the stuff was on there? Uh, I don't know. Uh, the uh, the shaft went... Uh, they started sinking the shaft in 1927, I think. The Taylor shaft. Because mm. across the road, a lot of people get confused. Across the road, that's called Eastpool as well. Mm. But uh, they had two shafts very close and uh, one of them caved completely. And they knew that uh, the other one wasn't going to last long, so they started sinking Taylor's shaft. Mm. That's why, simply because across the road, where that uh, National Trust thing is, there was shafts there, and uh, at one point they were almost came together. Uh, and at that point, I think there, there was a big collapse, a massive collapse on the ground. And I think uh, initially, they were uh, they were using uh, mobile compressors, but once once they started going down, actually they the uh, East Pool they held a record for uh, the amount of footage sunk in a month. I forget what it was, but I've seen it in the uh, in the books. It's quite a good record. Mm. So you got um, compressors underground as well, or were you just got no, the no. Air, the airlines under pressure? No, no, no. that was a trouble. Uh, once you got further and further away from the compressors, you lost a lot. You lost mm -hmm. a lot. But Crofty were different. I think they had uh, heat exchangers and they could maintain the, the pressure yeah. right to the face. But if you were working at Eastpool <coughs> and you were in a warm spot, and it was very, very hot underground at Eastpool, if you were in a warm spot, you'd like to turn on some compressed air to blow <laughs> and keep it cool. Uh, and a man on a machine... <laughs> Where he come and he come to the bottom of the ladder and turn your air off because he didn't have enough on his on his machine, you know. All a bit archaic. <laughs> what was the? I mean, I was going to say if the air temperature was if the compressed air was quite refreshing. What was the water like? Was that quite warm? Yes, in that uh, there were little springs bubbling up there. You could uh, you could really stand in and uh, have a wash. The only thing it was uh, it was mineral water. It was you know, it's like almost trying to wash in seawater, really. <coughs> but uh, a lot of the places down there, you didn't wear anything at all. Literally nothing, only a helmet and boots. Nothing else. What did it smell like down there? It's, was it stale or stuffy? Or? Uh, can't remember now. Can't remember. If you stand on the top of East Pool shaft and smell some of the funk coming out now, but I don't think anyway, it's drifting out now because uh, before it was coming out uh, by uh, fan, now it isn't. Cold weather, you can see it just meandering out. But before it was blowing out because Crofty had a, 
extracted from that to keep, you know, because they linked up with these poor women. <coughs> Funky, warm, warm, clammy air, really. Some places where, uh, if you hadn't been in for a while, where there's a lot of rotten timber, you know, it would, it would smell a bit. Yeah, what did that, um, the, the sort of the old areas, that you, the disused, abandoned areas that you said you were walking through, what was that like? Is that still quite warm and foggy? Or that no, it, because you were getting, you were, uh, those big areas, I'm talking about uh, uh, 14, 13, 11 and 10, where you were getting nearer the surface, so it was quite cool, really. It was only in that mine as you went deeper and deeper uh, and in depth and then you started going further away. You just had no air. Mm. There's no way of circulating air, was there? Mm. Uh, because uh, you only had the one shaft. If you had another shaft, uh, like Crafty, where you had a downcast and an upcast, it wasn't too bad, but each pool was just going into dead ground all the time. Mm. <coughs> you, for your air, you're, rely, you're uh, relying on seepage through pipes that weren't screwed up properly or somebody had had the air turned on, you know. Yeah. If it got too hot, well you didn't you had to have air on to uh, keep it cool. Yeah. <clears throat> we used to have past this sent underground from the canteen. But nine penny and six penny. Regardless of which one you ordered. If you weren't back shaft at the time they came down, you got a six pound. <laughs> if you weren't there to, to pick it up, if you were a bit late coming out, there's a six penny one there. No matter what you'd ordered, somebody else would have your nine penny one. Well, what happened about meal breaks? I mean, if you were down, if you were down for the full eight hours, then what did you get in terms of rest periods and oh, meal you breaks? Didn't. Straight through. Yeah, well, you you you. Uh, you either took your meal mm. when you finished. It depends what you were doing. Uh, like if you were drilling in a stove, you uh, you'd get say the majority of your drilling done that you had to do, and then you'd come down and have uh, your crib or a kraus and a drink and a smoke, and then go back. You know, well, not all depend on on the work. If uh, if the work was easy, well, you could. I know I've seen uh, blokes fall asleep on the ground, they didn't have much to do, so they keep out. And we had one, had one chappy, he was called Leslie Webster, he's died now. But he was working with me at 290 at Cooks, uh, Cooks or Robinson's, I forget. And he'd been having an argument with a chappy in Kerharak where we lived. And this chappy had gone in the army. And the argument, every time this man came home on leave, the argument always came up, you know. So Leslie Webster said to me one day, he said, he's home on leave. So he said, if you want to see a bit of fun, you come down to the Seven Stars tonight. This is quite true. He said, you come down to the Seven Stars tonight. I said, right. Went down there and Leslie was one end of the bar and this chappy in his army uniform the other end uh, both getting well well so do you know. Anyway, come ten o'clock or whatever. Albert uh, Bill Jory, he was a he kept the pub then. Right, time gentlemen. So uh, Leslie Webster came out first. Yeah, I love that bag you know. And out comes this Soldier. Well, it was a bit dark. Well, it's a chap called Ernie Chapman. He was lamping. In those days, everybody went lamping with dogs for rabbits. And, and he had a big lamp on his chest. And he said, let's have a bit of light. And he switched the light on. And Leslie went up to the soldier. Went like that, and he aimed a blow at him. And the soldier ducked. And Leslie hit the granite wall of the pub with his fist. Well, that was him finished, you know. Anyway, the next morning, he came out on the bus with me, and he kept his hand well hidden. He said, come on, and we went underground. But soon he got underground, and he said, look, he said, I'm going to work it. He said, if uh, 
anybody asks, he said, I fell, slipped and fell, and held my hand against, oh, that's all right. So he away went and went up, got a cage up. No sooner he'd been up than the Reggie oh, ship first came in. Where's your partner? I said, he fell and hurt himself and he's gone up. Bloody liar, he said. He had a fight out crowd cards night. <laughs> <laughs> Reggie Moyle. Reggie Moyle. He's still got a son who lives down there, man. <laughs> Called Darcy Moyle. He said, I bet he had a bloody fight and he hurt his hand. He said, he ain't going to get any compensation from us. <clears throat> anyway, when I got off the bus at three o'clock, there was this soldier there waiting expecting to see Les get off the bus with me, you see. And he had never had a mark on him. But Les had had to go to hospital and he'd pushed all his knuckles back. He was in a hell of a mess. Mm. And the soldier came up to me. Where's your bloody man? That's what he mean. He said, at Webster. I said, I don't know where he is. He said, I'll have that bugger, he said. When Les was indoors, he didn't come out. Because <laughs> this soldier lived next door to him, you see. If, he, if he'd come out, he would have slaughtered it. Anyway, Les then come out for days and days. And somebody, I think it was a chap called Peter Wales, he worked at Crofty, he went to the soldier and he said, look, forget it, you'll, you'll be going back off leave in a day or two. He said, forget it. He said, he's got a badly damaged hand. No, that was Leslie. And that was, that was the end of it. Ooh, he aimed a blow at that man in Missy. You would have heard him when he hit the wall. It was just like somebody treading on an empty matchbox, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the funniest heads. <laughs> you, you can, you can, uh, you can remember these things all the time. You know, different little things that happen. <clears throat> one thing I will say is that the the. Uh, it's an old clay workers who came down. They all worked underground with us and are very, very good men. I mean, they've got the name for work. Mm. It's an old man and they were very good underground there. The Italians were absolutely useless. You couldn't blame them. They were all prisoners of war. Mm. The Belgian coal miners were very, very good men. Excellent, excellent. But there's two killed there. Actually, I've got the names here. <coughs> 